So um, I've got a few different hats. Primarily, I'm a neuroscientist at the Karolinska Institute and Stockholm University. I'm, uh, I've recently started working with the Swedish National Data Service, and I am what's called an ambassador for the Center for Open Science, which is the organization behind the, the uh, badges for open science that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, have you seen the open badges before? How many have seen them? About half, that's very nice. <laughs> uh, they've been around for about four years now, since 2013. Uh, and uh, uh, so they were started by the Center for Open Science, which is the same place that was behind uh, the reproducibility project psychology and the open science framework. And, and I'm sure most of you have uh, uh, heard about it before. The criteria for these badges were defined by a committee of scientists from uh, different disciplines, and my own role in this has been to chair this committee for the last uh, four years, uh, since we defined the criteria at the outset. I've now handed over to uh, a colleague, uh, Professor John Gray, just a few weeks ago. Uh, the aim is and was to recognize, I'm sorry for this spelling error, and promote best practice. So. Uh, the most important decision uh, we made, I think, at the outset was to decide whether we wanted to incentivize anything that's an improvement or whether we wanted to incentivize just the best practices, which is what we decided to do. So, for example, to get the open data badge, uh, you have to put the data in a repository uh, that archives it in a way that is uh, time-stamped, uh, immutable, uh, and uh, accessible with a, uh, a digital link. It's not sufficient, for example, to put the data in supplementary materials to a published paper. Uh, the badges are issued by journals. They can be issued in principle by anyone. Uh, so the Center for Open Science has decided on the criteria, but it's up to anyone who wants to award the badges to uh, implement them and to decide whether a scientific product meets the criteria or not. So actually, the, the uh, uh, credibility of the badges depends uh, not only on the badge itself, but also on the issuer. Uh, as far as I know, there isn't a lot of variation, though, in how they are issued. Uh, we've had uptake here uh, uh, by journals initially in psychology and now in other areas, and we have 27 journals now that award the badges. This is what it can look like. This is a table of contents from the journal Psychological Science. You can see that the top paper there has uh, one badge for open data and one badge for open materials. And the bottom two papers also have badges. Uh, psychological science was first to introduce the badges, and the effect of the badges has been evaluated in that journal. This is the percentage of articles that report data being available. You have here in black uh, psychological science uh, the uh, vertical dotted line is when the badges were introduced. And then there are uh, three comparable uh, journals in psychology uh, for reference uh, where badges were not introduced uh, at this time. So this was not a randomized trial, but I think uh, there are good reasons to suspect that the introduction of the badges uh, caused this uh, increase in uh, data being published. There was also an increase in quality of the data uh, published. What we have here in blue is uh, the papers in psychological science that got badges. Uh, in green, papers in the same journal before badges. In red, papers in the same journal that did publish data openly but did not uh, apply to get a badge. And uh, the bottom there in uh, some sort of brown uh, is uh, uh, comparison journals without badges. This is now looking at only the papers that published data openly. And the data submissions were uh, assessed by volunteers who decided whether the data is actually available as reported, whether the data is correct, that is to say whether it is what it uh, says in the paper that it should be, whether the data is useful, or if there are things like unintelligible uh, column headers, and if the data is complete, so whether the uh, uh, person making the assessment thought that the uh, analysis reported could be uh, performed again using this data. Uh, so that's rather encouraging. Um, there are still things we don't know about this. Uh, we can't conclusively say that there is a causal relationship between introducing the badges and having these uh, positive effects. 
Uh, there's also some debate about whether it's actually an incentive that we've got here, or whether it's uh, more of a, uh, an, uh, a thing that gives uh, scientists information about what the journal policy is and what expectations are in the field. We don't know that. And of course, we don't know how this uh, would look if we did it again, and in other journals, and in other fields, and so on. So what we're working on in the committee right now is mostly to try to increase uptake, and we're also planning uh, further evaluation uh, to see how well uh, these uh, findings hold up in other places. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gustav. Do we have any questions? Uh, I'm just, I think it's amazing, and it's just so impressive to see that increase of numbers. So I guess regardless of how representative it is, I think that's quite a quite a good good number, and that's a positive development. I was just wondering, do you possibly have any surveys among researchers? What did they think about the data being available in these journals? What did they did they think that these papers are more credible? Did was there perhaps any citation difference or this kind of effect? You know, of those papers that had the open data badges with them. That's an excellent idea. I think we'd like to uh, look at the citation differences. Uh, we don't have any survey data. Mm -hmm. uh, of the, uh, yeah, we don't have any survey data. Thank you. Any other questions for Gustav? No? Okay. Oh. Thank you very much, Gustav.